Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DIPI workshop. In this introduction, we will go through a brief review of the research on the white matter of the brain. This presentation will contain three parts and have an emphasis on the translational research that uses anatomical information in non-human primates to improve diffusion tractography and inform human brain connectivity. In part one, we will talk about why studying the white matter is important from both a basic neuroscience point of view and the perspective of clinical applications. In part two, we will go through some basics of the major bundles in the human brain and look at their morphology and connectivity patterns. In part three, I will discuss the challenge in diffusion tractography and the current efforts from translational neuroanatomy that uses non-human primates to advance our, our knowledge in humans. Okay, now let's start with the big question. Why study the white matter? We know that um, DIPI is a tool for diffusion MRI analysis and diffusion MRI is a technology for studying the white matter of the brain. But why do we care so much about white matter in the first place? A major reason is that the white matter is composed of connections between neurons. We know that neurons are the basic computing units of the brain and they communicate with each other through axons. Most axons are wrapped in myelin, which is the biological material that make them look white. So studying the white matter is to study the neural connections and how neurons are connected is essential for understanding their computations. On the left here is an example of a brain network related with decision-making. The regions colored in purple, blue, green, pink, and yellow all show increased activity when people are doing decision-making tasks. In patients with obsessive compulsive disorder, these regions have also been found to show abnormalities. Indeed, almost all brain functions involve more than one region, and most brain diseases affect multiple regions. This indicates that to fully understand the function and dysfunction, we have to take into account not only the regions, but also their connections. On the right-hand side is another example from a study on mood disorder. These are the FA maps showing abnormal low values in patients colored in red and blue. These low FA values indicate impairment in the white matter integrity. You can see that the impairment is localized in precisely confined regions. This means that if we want to develop treatment that targets the abnormalities, we need precise information of brain connectivity in these regions. Let's follow up on the OCD example and look at a treatment procedure called deep brain stimulation. This procedure uses implanted electrodes to deliver currents in the brain. The sites that are responsive to the stimulation have been found in both gray and white matter. In the right figure, you can see the electrodes targeting the space between the blue and purple structures. This is a white matter region that shows positive effects to stimulation. It is called the anterior limb of the internal capsule. It is a small white matter volume buried in the striatum. And the striatum is part of a subcortical structure called the basal ganglia. The internal capsule passes through the striatum to connect the cortex with the midbrain. You can see a full picture of it on the left, illustrated by these colorful streamlines. You can see the connections of the internal capsule is widespread. If a physician is planning a surgery to implant the electrodes, it is very important to locate not only the internal capsule, but precisely the part of it that connects the regions related to OCD symptoms. So how do we figure out the detailed connections? This is the exact place that neuroanatomy and diffusion MRI can come to help.
Before we jump into the fiber bundles that connect different parts of the brain, let's remind ourselves a little bit of history of the neuroanatomy research in humans. It is used to be a postmortem science. The most widely used method is named after its inventor, Klinger. The procedure is to first freeze and thaw the brain tissue, and then systematically peel away white matter fibers to expose the target tracts for investigation. This way, one can examine the trajectories of major white um, major fiber bundles in the whole brain. Klinkler's method had dominated the field for decades until the 1990s, when magnetic resonance imaging and modern microscopy techniques started to take off. Before we delve into diffusion tractography, here are two microscopy techniques worth mentioning. One is polarized light imaging, PLI. The other is optical coherence tomography, OCT. Both use light reflection or refraction to delineate fibers at mi micrometer resolution. Like Klinger's method, these are relying on postmortem tissues as well. Around similar times in the 90s, the diffusion imaging technique was starting to be developed as well. Its resolution is higher than Klinger's method and lower than the macroscopy methods. But most importantly, this is an in, in vivo method. Up to this day, diffusion MRI is still the only non-invasive method to map fiber pathways in a living brain. Here is briefly how it works. The diffusion weighted signal reflects the direction of water diffusion in the brain. In the axons, water diffuses most easily along the long axis thus generates strongly anisotropic diffusion signal. Based on this signal, one can model the most plausible orientation of axons in different locations of the brain and put these pieces of information together to infer the trajectories of axons. Given this technique, we now have a pretty good general picture of the major fiber bundles in the living human brain. We will go through some of them in the next part. In part two, we will go through major fiber bundles that make long range connections in the brain. The human brain is composed of two hemispheres and each hemisphere can be divided into four lobes, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. We can think of the major fiber bundles as highways that connect regions across hemispheres and across lobes in order to facilitate the information transfer between neurons that are far apart. The content we will cover here is based on the review paper by Bullock et al. published in Cerebral Cortex in 2022. It covers 21 bundles about their morphology and related function and disease. You can refer to this paper for more information if you are interested. Now, let's start with the major bundle that connects across hemispheres, the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is perhaps the best understood white matter structure. Panel A is an illustration of corpus callosum fibers generated from diffusion tractography as streamlines. These streamlines connect the left and right cerebral cortex.
panel B shows the white matter volume at the midline of the brain, where the fibers pass through between the two hemispheres. You may have seen in papers that different parts of this volume have different names. The anterior end is called the genu. The posterior end is the splenium, and its central portion is called the body. Damage to the corpus callosum can cause disconnection syndrome, which involves a lack of interhemispheric transfer of sensory information and difficulties with the performance of bilaterally coordinated motor tasks. Now let's move on to panel C. It shows another bundle that connects the two hemispheres, the, the anterior commissure. It is the second largest cerebral commissure. It is a prominent landmark to align different subjects' brains in MRI analysis. The anterior commissure carries crossing fibers from the basal surface of the cerebral cortex, from the zone extending from the temporal pole and posterior orbital frontal cortex to the occipital temporal boundary. Finally, let's look at panel D. It shows our old friend internal capsule. If you recall, we have encountered it in the deep brain stimulation example in part one. Unlike the corpus callosum and anterior commissure, the internal capsule does not connect across hemispheres. Instead, it carries fibers between the cortex and subcortical structures, including the thalamus, brainstem, spinal cord, and, subthal and subthalamic nucleus. Now, let's look at a bundle that runs anterior posteriorly to connect the frontal and parietal lobes. It is called the superior longitudinal fasciculus, SLF. It has multiple separable components, although how many is a matter of debate. A common division is to have three components numbered one to three from dorsal to ventral. On the right two panels, you can see the dorsal ventral relationship more easily. On the top is the SLF1 colored in magenta. In the middle is SLF2 in green, and on the bottom is SLF3 in blue. They connect between different frontal and parietal regions. The SLF complex is associated primarily with language, but also with musical ability, tool use, and working memory. The SLF may act as a relay between the frontal and temporal language regions. Finally, patients with schizophrenia have, abnormal have abnormalities in the SLF, which is consistent with the broad frontal parietal abnormalities observed in this disorder. Now let's turn our attention to the temporal cortex. In this figure, we have two bundles that connect with the temporal lobe. The purple one is the middle longitudinal fasciculus, MDLF. It runs dorsal ventrally. The dorsal end is in the prior parietal cortex and the ventral end is in the temporal lobe. Its precise termination in the parietal cortex has been under debate. Early tractography results showed discrepancies such that some studies reported termination in the superior parietal lobule and the others in the inferior lobule, but not both. Subsequent studies seem to have found string lines in both lobules. This debate needs further experimental evidence to resolve. Possible functions related with the MDLF include language, attentional processing, auditory perception, and auditory visual integration. This other bundle colored in yellow here is the arcuate fasciculus. It is a long, anterior posteriorly directed bundle. It runs laterally in the temporal, parietal, and frontal lobes. It carries fibers between the temporal cortex 
and some parts of the frontal lobe. The arcuate fasciculus is thought to be essential for language function. Indeed, it has been associated with conduction of fascia. Lesions of this bundle following stroke can also cause language deficits. What about the occipital connections? Here, we, we show two bundles. The purple one is called the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, IFOF. The IFOF here is mapped by diffusion tractography. It runs anterior posteriorly to connect the frontal and occipital lobes. There is a major debate on whether the IFOF exists in humans, which has not been resolved. If you're interested, the review paper by Bullock et al. has a detailed coverage on this pretty interesting debate. Briefly, neuroanatomists have not been able to observe direct connections between the ventral visual cortex and the basal frontal cortex. Therefore, they believe that the IFOF is a false positive when identified by tractography. Resolving this issue will likely require meticulous tractography, track tracing, and dissection studies across species. Now, this other bundle colored in green is the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, ILF. It has also been a subject of debate. The disagreement among neuroanatomists centers on which particular cortical connections define this bundle, as well as its precise termination in the posterior cortex. Regardless, the functions of the ILF are thought to relate with the ventral visual system. For example, lesions of the ILF lead to deficits in object recognition, alexia, and visual memory. The ILF is likely also involved in face recognition. Finally, we will look at two bundles that connect with the limbic cortex. Pa panel A shows the cingulum bundle captured by tractography. Panel B illustrates its components in the monkey brain. It contains a dorsal component shown in pink and yellow. It also contains a subgenual component shown in red, which curves around the genu of the corpus callosum. Going posteriorly, the green color labels a temporal component that curves around the splenium and extends anteriorly into the most medial part of the temporal lobe. The single lung bundle is a target for treating patients with major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and chronic pain. On the right-hand side, this bundle in panel C is the uncinate fasciculus, which has a hook-like shape. It connects the orbital frontal cortex with the anterior temporal pole. The information transfer between these two parts of cortex is thought to be related with memory processing. Injury to the uncinate fasciculus can cause isolated retrograde am amnesia. In patients with Alzheimer's disease, this bundle shows decreased FA values, and this change may be related to memory deficits. With the uncinate fasciculus, we conclude our part two on major bundles in the brain. In part three, I will discuss the current cha challenge in diffusion tractography and efforts from translational neuroanatomy that uses non-human primates to advance our knowledge in humans. <laughs>
Most of the major fiber bundles can be mapped in vivo using diffusion MRI. Have we achieved the goal of mapping every fiber pathway in the human brain with this excellent technology? To gain some sense of the big picture, here is a review that came out in 2020, which did a survey of three authoritative neuroanatomy textbooks. The survey provided the percentage of studies cited to support each pathway mentioned in the books. Somewhat surprisingly, the majority of our current knowledge comes from animal studies. That is, we inferred the pathways in humans from observations in animals by assuming cross-species homology. This means a large part of the human brain connectivity is still unknown. To quote the authors of the review, one essential aspect of the human central nervous system structure is virtually unknown. Precisely, where a specific connection or originates and terminates in the brain. What is stopping us from understanding the human brain directly? A limitation of diffusion tractography is that it's an indirect way to measure anatomical connections. The same diffusivity pattern can be generated by different configurations of axons. Thus, there is no unique solution to the inference problem. For example, in the schematic drawing here, the water diffusivity points to two dominant directions. If an estimated fiber trajectory reaches this crossing point, how do we know whether it should continue straight, turn right, or turn left? Without additional information about the underlying anatomy, there is no way to decide solely based on the diffusion model. However, there is only one anatomical ground truth. This means that diffusion tractography is prone to errors in the regions with crossing fibers. Here is what animal studies can help. To solve the problem, we need some prior knowledge of what the ground truth is. And most of the knowledge comes from humans' closest relatives the non-human primates. When we look at the history of neuroanatomy, there is a parallel branch dedicated to animal research. The very early methods relied on staining techniques and they are applicable to both human and non-human brains. These techniques are not sensitive enough to distinguish microstructures. In the 1950s, a type of selective staining emerged for, de for degenerated axons. It worked by introducing degeneration to specific groups of neurons in living animals and staining the degenerated pathway in the postmortem brain. This method is so much more sensitive to previous staining techniques, but it is limited by the difficulty to locate the origin of the degeneration. In these experiments, the origin was often unknown. Then in the 1970s, a more advanced tracing technique was developed and became the standard that is still in use today. Track tracing also combines in vivo and postmortem processing, but instead of introducing degeneration, it relies on the uptake of injected molecules by the neurons in the regions of interest. As shown in this figure, a neural tracer was injected into the inferior temporal region. The tracer molecules traveled inside the axons in the intact, unlesioned brain by normal physiological mechanisms. The animal was then sacrificed and the brain was sliced and prepared for staining. Chemical reactions in the staining made the trajectories of the tracer visible, including its origin, passage, and termination. By going through the stained brain slices one after another under the microscope, one can reconstruct the full details of the fiber pathway being studied. Thus, track tracing is a highly precise and highly sensitive method to study brain connectivity at a single axon resolution.
There are three types of labeling in track tracing that are most important for inferring brain connectivity patterns. The first is the labeling of neuron bodies. Tracers can travel upstream or, or so-called retrogradely from the injection site to the neurons that project to the injection site. Thus, the labeled neurons will tell us from which brain areas the injection site receives input. The second type of labeling is the terminal fields. These are the destinations of tracers that traveled downstream or anterior greatly from the injection site. The terminal fields indicate to which brain areas the neurons from the injection site project. A third type of labeling is fibers in the white matter. These sometimes show up as a thick, bright stream that looks like a stick near the injection site. But most commonly, they are very fine lines in the deep white matter or passing through the gray matter. These fine lines tell us the relative position of the injection specific connections within major fiber bundles. Thus, a track tracing experiment can provide very rich information regarding the connectivity of a particular injection, its input, its output, and the root of these connections. Now, coming back to the question about how our knowledge from animal studies can help understand the human brain. The information provided by track tracing is based on direct measurement of the fiber pathways. It can be treated as the ground truth. And no human primates are the closest relatives to humans among experimental animals. Therefore, under the assumption of homology, we've already gained a lot of insights from decades of track tracing studies. But the question is, can we do better than that? Is there a way to quantitatively and systematically translate the ground truth into humans? The answer is yes. And we have computational neural anatomy to combine the, the two fields. The critical step is to use non-human primate diffusion imaging as a translational step. Recently, animal neural imaging is going through rapid development. It is now possible to acquire high resolution diffusion weighted images, both in vivo and post-mortem from animal brains. Thus, a potential strategy for translational neural anatomy follows three general steps. First, one can compare track tracing and tractography in the same species, in this case, the non-human primates. In this way, we can rule out cross-species differences and focus on the discrepancies caused by methodological issues. We can then try to reproduce the track tracing results by adjust the modeling and tractography algorithms with the diffusion data. Finally, with the adjusted algorithms, we can explore those homologous pathways in the human brain without being confused by the methodological discrepancy. This strategy using monkey tractography to translate anatomical ground truth into studying human brain connectivity has been successful in several studies. Back to the problem we mentioned earlier that mapping the connections in the internal capsule is important for guiding deep brain stimulation sites in OCD patients. We mentioned that it is important to accurately target the anterior limb of the internal capsule or ALEC for short. The reason is that fibers connecting the brain regions that are relevant to OCD symptoms occupy subregions in the ALEC in a topographic ma manner. For example, fibers originated from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex pass through the ventral portion of the ALEC. 
which is shown in red in this figure. More dorsal to this zone are fibers from the anterior cingulate cortex colored in yellow. More dorsally are the fibers from dorsal prefrontal cortex colored in green and blue. This topographical pattern was clearly observed in track tracing studies. In the paper by Safadi et al, the authors compared monkey tractography and track tracing data to rule out false positive pathways. With the adjusted tractography result, they identified a highly consistent topographical pattern of the prefrontal fibers in the human alic, as shown on the left figure here. So this is from a human brain. The red, yellow, green, and blue followed the same dorsal ventral pattern as found in monkeys. Another example is a hub region in the anterior cingulate cortex that was firstly identified in the monkey tracing data and then replicated in the human brain, as shown in the two figures on the right. The authors first located a region in the rostral tip of the cingulate sulcus, where the injection resulted an extensive connectivity pattern with a diverse range of frontal areas. They replicated this convergent connectivity pattern with tractography, firstly in monkeys and then in humans using the same algorithm. In the last example from an ongoing work, I would like to show you a case where a fiber pathway is proved to exist in the monkey, but is missing from human tractography. By analyzing the possible cause behind this false inactive, we were able to adjust the tractography algorithm and recover this pathway in humans. This figure shows the pathway in the monkey. On the left panel is the labeling pattern from track tracing. The tracer was injected into the black area in the cingulate cortex. It travels laterally into the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. You can see the trajectory labeled by the tracer in the yellow circles. This pathway was correctly replicated in the monkey tractography result, shown on the middle and right panels. The middle panel is the, is the density of streamlines from a seed in the same location as the injection site. The streamlines showed similar trajectories as compared to the tracing patterns. In a more complete view on the right, you can see all the streamlines from the seed on the top. The streamlines clearly traveled to the lateral cortex and also entered the extreme capsule. You can see the isolated extreme capsule on the bottom. This is consistent with the track tracing results on the bottom left, where EMC denotes the extreme capsule. When we put a seed in the human cingulate cortex and run tractography, the lateral pathway is missing and no streamline entered the extreme capsule. As you can see on the right here, the corresponding locations in the yellow circles have very low streamline density or no streamline at all. And compare the bottom figure in between the monkey and the human, you can see that the extreme capsule is completely missing in a human. So does it mean that this pathway doesn't exist in the human at all? Not likely. It's more likely a technical problem. When you look at the fiber orientation distribution in the problematic region where streamlines are missing, you may notice that these distributions are overwhelmingly dominated by one orientation that runs in and out of screen. This means that most of the streamlines will travel longitudinally from anterior to posterior rather than laterally from medial to lateral. 
it is true that in this region of the white matter, there are a lot of fibers traveling longitudinally than laterally, so much so that the signal of the lateral orientation becomes indistinguishable from noise. We try to boost the signal to noise ratio by looking at the variance across subjects. If the variance of an orientation is small, then it's more likely a signal than noise. If the variance across subjects are high, then it's more, like, more likely noise than signal. Based on this principle, we adjusted the fiber orientation functions and guess what we found? The lateral fibers and the extreme capsule. We are now in an exciting era where massive accounts of multimodal data are becoming publicly available. Many of the human imaging databases are already well known and well utilized, such as Open Neuro and the Human Connectome Project. I especially want to point out some of the fast developing non human primate resources. PrimeDE hosts monkey imaging data, including structural, functional and diffusion for both task and resting states. It is now growing very fast. CocoMac has been out there for a while. It provides cytoarchitectonic and connection information that covers extensive areas of the monkey brain. Cor CoreNets is a track tracing database focusing on the connection information. MacBrain resource is hosted at Yale it contains a large collection of brain tissues as a legacy from the Goldman Ruckage Lab. Its access is based on request. On the other hand, big data brings big challenges. Analyzing track tracing tissues is very labor intensive. It requires examination under the microscope at a high magnification, which can take weeks to finish. One of the challenges that attracts computer scientists is to automate this process by applying deep learning algorithms to the microscopy images. However, it's less straightforward in practice than it sounds, partly because the huge amount of data. It is very common for a single image of a slice to exceed five gigabytes, for example. The automatized track tracing is an active research field. And there is, of course, an ongoing challenge from cross species difference. We still haven't fully figured out how exactly the monkey and human brains differ in their connectivity. Relatedly, when using track tracing to correct for tractography algorithms in monkeys, the problems are highly specific to the pathway being studied and have to be fixed in a case by case way. Can we find a generalizable algorithm that is applicable to a more general range of pathways in both species? These are all open questions to be figured out in the future. Now, I wanna thank you for going through this anatomical intro at the DiPi workshop. This is meant as a reminder that Despite the complex computational problems tractography faces, the ultimate question is a biological one. That is precisely where a specific connection originates and terminates in the brain. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop in which you'll learn about the tools for tackling this question. Thank you. <laughs>